All right. Um, good morning to everybody. Um, as I was getting ready, thinking what I'm going to say, I was willing to go through my notes and then going for my backpack. And where's my backpack? I don't find my backpack. So we're going to do a, a you guys are going to help me, right? This is going to be kind of a crowdsourcing uh, exercise because I need my backpack. I basically have there my, my computer, my, uh, uh, my iPad, yes, my uh, book, my Kindle book. So, um, so why don't we, you, you guys help me, and uh, you're going to help me look for my backpack. It's just a black backpack. Uh, it has to be around there. In fact, I'm going to, to help, and you know, I'm going to motivate this a little bit. Uh, whoever finds the backpack, you know, as the tour that you saw yesterday, they were giving $100. I'm going to give you one yuan, okay? It's more interesting, okay, when you are. So yeah, run, okay, my backpack has to be there. Have a lot of good stuff there, important stuff. Yeah, search, search. We're not doing a good progress here. Uh, what about, <laughs> um, I have a yellow label on top of it. Javier, watch out. Uh, <laughs> We have a yellow uh, label on top of it. It's, it's a yellow, it's a very distinctive one. I don't see, oh yeah, you find it. <laughs> You're going to be the proud receiver of a one yuan now. Okay, all right. So this is what I call crowdsourcing in a way, intelligence, crowd intelligence, how we actually have an idea of a pattern that we are looking for and we don't, we don't really know how my backpack looks like without some help. Once I give you some help, you were able to actually find a pattern that match the most the knowledge or your context. So I'm going to try to put that in perspective. But before that, I'm going to give you a little notice of the coming, uh, in fact, in one year from now, it's going to be the next face and gesture recognition IEEE conference that I'm chairing. Uh, and I invite you, kindly invite you there, if you do work in the area of machine vision, image processing related to face recognition or gesture recognition, you are more than welcome. This is going to be in Buenos Aires. It's a fun city, uh, and you're going to really enjoy it. So please, uh, this is going to be between May 18th to the 22nd, all right? All right, let's get started then. So we talk about patterns, but I'm going to First, I uh, would like to clarify what are the takeaways that I would like you to, to know once we are over. And I'm going to show this in the beginning because I know that I'm not going to make on time my presentation. So I put that in the very beginning. So I want to convince you that it's better to recognize objects by their characteristics rather than by their categories, which is what we usually do. And this has what we call, this is soft classification, has a lot of advantages. I'm going to deal with the problem of learning from very few, very little information, very few examples, uh, as opposed to what everybody right now is crazy about, which is learning from lots of data, because we do have lots of data for most of the problems, right? Um, and I'm also going to tell you how actually we can solve this type of problem injecting expert knowledge, providing context, how we can actually model the context. And in the end, I'm going to talk about the idea of transfer learning, going from learning from very few examples to generalize to more uh, larger problems, to the main challenge that I think that we are all after, which is lifelong learning, the ability to learn continuously. All right, so those are my takeaways. Um, let's, let's discuss a little bit what are the main paradigms of machine learning. I think that most of you know the N-shot learning paradigm. So we are here in the N-shot. The N-shot is the one that is on the left, on the bottom left. N-shot learning is you have, significant, I mean, you have a significant amount of examples, observations that you can learn and then you see a new observation and you actually classify that. So in the context of animals, you see a lot of cats and dogs, and then I show you a new picture of my dog, and you're going to see it and say, hey, that's a dog, right? That's end-shot learning, the most classical 
and most, uh, most adopted paradigm of learning. Um, so there's a lot of work. Since deep learning, I changed, if you notice, I changed the number from 100 to 100K. We have tons of data, and we use all that to generalize. Then we move, I'm going to, to increase, make a more difficult problem from here, which is move to the one-shot learning problem, where you have only one instance that you see, and you need to be able to generalize. So I'm going to show you only one picture of a dog and one picture of a cat. And then I'm going to show you a new picture of a dog, a different dog, and I want you to be able to recognize that that's a dog. And I think that you can do that, right? So we call that one-shot learning. There is some interesting work in the very recent years about this paradigm. I'm going to make things more difficult. Why? Because I believe that to solve our main problem of li lifelong learning, we need to really solve this, tackle these challenges one by one and have solutions for them. So let's go into zero-shot learning. Zero-shot learning, I'm going to show you pictures, a lot of pictures of cats and dogs and cows. And yeah, cows is a good idea, cows, horses. And then I'm going to show you a picture of a zebra. Now, you never saw a zebra, okay? After you saw all my other pictures and you are trained, I'm going to show you a picture of a zebra. I want you to be able to understand, doesn't matter whether you call that a zebra or not, but I want you to understand that it's somehow a mix of, of a horse and a cow, if you want, right? I mean, it has, has these black and white stripes, the cow has the big black, uh, the black and white uh, uh, stains, and then you have, uh, and it looks really like a horse, right? So we can really put that in context. We know that it's like a mixture of a few animals, has some characteristics of those, but it's none of that. It's none of what we saw before. It's totally new class. This is what we call zero-shot learning. Another interesting thing is I promise that you never saw a zebra before, okay? Now, I'm going to make things more difficult. I'm going to also show you pictures of cats and dogs and everything, okay? No zebras. But then I'm going to show you a new picture of an animal that animal may be you have observed in the past and maybe not. And I'm not going to tell you that. We call that problem generalized zero-shot learning because you have no idea what's going to expect. Now, can we make things more difficult? Yes. I'm going to only show one picture of a dog, one picture of a cat, and then I'm going to show you whatever I want and you need to be able to understand what is that, alone from only the observations that you had. We call that the generalized hard zero-shot learning. And my point here is if you succeed solving that problem successfully, I mean, if you, if you can deal with that, you actually are extremely close to lifelong learning. All right, so um, let's move forward. Let's go to the conventional paradigm. Okay, animals, you have seen a lot of databases of animals. Here are the animals. Here are the categories or the names of the animals. And, of course, the traditional paradigm is that we want to learn this mapping, right? We call that hard classification. Why? Because we see the tiger, the tiger and we see and we learn the name. We see a horse and we learn the name. But we don't really understand what are the attributes behind those categories. So we call that hard classifier. Properties are ignored. And this is a fixed number of categories, right? Now, if I'm going to present a new animal, I need to retrain the system. OK, you can argue that with some new architectures of deep learning, you only need to do some form of transfer learning, but training, retraining is necessary. And this is a disadvantage, OK? Now, let's look at the other two paradigms, zero-shot and one-shot paradigm. First of all, why we care at all about that? I mean, it's not everything and shot learning. Well, it turns out that it's not. Some phenomena occurs once in a lifetime, maybe a couple of times. I mean, we know examples of tsunamis, okay? We know example of revolutions. Doesn't occur many times in a, in a lifetime. Crash of a stock market, neurological diseases, 
that because they are so rare, so seldom, we cannot really come up with a cure. We don't have enough subjects to actually understand what's going on. So really being able to solve this problem has a, a critical, will have a critical impact, right? So I'm not going to use now pictures of animals, dogs and cats, sorry to disappoint you. I know that this is a machine vision conference, but I'm going to use gestures. Why? Because I, I like things difficult. Why hand gestures? Because it's a natural form of communication between humans. You see how much I move my hands while I speak. Human machine systems, I believe, are going to use hand gestures. We talked yesterday about smart glasses. I do believe that we're going to interact with these smart glasses using gestures. In fact, if you look at the HoloLens, already there is an interface that recognizes gestures in real time. It is the Google Glass, of course, before they crash. They uh, had an algorithm to recognize gestures. Uh, autonomous cars, you can actually have some functionality of control using gestures, okay? So, and of course, it's a, it's a natural way to interact with, with robots. Now, there is a lot of, of work done with verbal language understanding, natural language understanding. There is not so much work done on gesture understanding. So those are going to be our guinea pigs, but our guinea pigs are tough. Why? because they are context dependent. Chesters, the meaning of chesters are depending on context and culture, right? So for example, if you look at this chester in Italy, is hey, you know, what's going on with you? What's, what's your problem? And if you do that, the, the same chester in, for example, in Israel, the meaning is wait, right? So there, there is context depending on chesters, it's time barring problems. We're moving from pictures. We're looking more into videos, maybe. A, sec a 10 seconds video can have a 1,000 images. Depends, of course, on the frame rate. And it's a high dimensional problem, OK? Usually, when we look into a activity recognition, we also look into depth information. Like using the Kinect camera, we are going to have RGB and depth information on time. So, so let's start with, with, let's go to the next big problem. So any shot we can do actually very good. I'm going to tell you how we actually solve one shot learning. We did some interesting experiments in neuroscience where we tried to see what we can generalize from one observation, okay? So what we found, we actually measure using EEG uh, signals we measure the activity in the human mirror neuron system, which activates when you see someone performing a gesture or when you perform a gesture. And we try to learn what are the patterns that exist on the same gestures that people perform. Not only that we can detect activation, but we can also detect activation at certain points within the gesture, okay? We call that inflection points or placeholders. So we came up with the realization that if we extract these inflection points and we perturb them, and then we actually connect between the results that we get, we can actually generate new instances of the gestures that have never seen. They are totally artificial, but when I show the result, it can be believed that a human performed them. And in this way, we can generate thousands of observations. Of course, you are thinking trajectories, how you're going to do things that are more complicated that involve finger configurations, right? You can apply the same trick. The complexity is going to be a little bit larger, but the same trick works. Um, and of course, the biomechanical constraints of how we generate the trajectory need to be, uh, need to be, meet, need to be met. So you need a biomechanical model of the human body. And now that we have a model for the cognitive process, we can actually augment data. We can augment data, this is a data augmentation technique, but it's based on mechanical or biomechanical and, and cognitive processes. And now that we have a lot of data, we do whatever we do, we do actually pretty good, which is end-shot learning. So great, we solve the problem of one-shot learning. Um, and then we move into a problem that whatever we did before, we cannot really use, it's totally useless, okay? So we start from zero again, zero-shot learning, I remind you, we have a bunch of gestures that we know their meaning or their functions. And then I'm going to show you, I'm going to train my system. And then I'm going to bring a totally new gesture. I want you to be able to predict what is the function, okay? Um, 
So let's go to what the literature says about the solution of this problem with animals. Go back to CIFAR 10 data set. And we see our animals. And this is an interesting work that has been done initially in the area of zero-shot learning, very recent, OK? Where we come up with semantic descriptors, and we try to describe our animals in terms of semantic descriptors. We can start asking the question, has tribes, yes or not? Uh, this wolf or this fox is brown, has a brown color, lives in land, has large ears. And we're going to come up with answers, some form of vector, that is going to represent these observations. Now we can learn this mapping. And furthermore, we can go to the semantic descriptors and map them further to a category. This is going to be a tiger. If it has, a, if it has a stripes, it's brown, lives on land, and so on and so forth. And in this way, we can start mapping all the semantic descriptors together and come up with categories. We call that soft classification because it requires dual mapping, of course. But this, um, this would work. And the nice thing is that there is no retraining. You can potentially come up with an interesting combination of semantic descriptors. So the first challenge that when we go back into our difficult problem of gestures is, what are the semantic descriptors of gestures? This is not really clear. So we went back. And first of all, we said, OK, let's try to understand the hyperplanes where this data exist. Right. So when we look into categories or hard classification, every class has a place, has a range in our hyperspace where whatever representation you use, features, uh, you know, your pixel intensities, whatever you use, this is going to have a region in your uh, hyperspace that you can actually cluster that, right? Um, but if we use semantic descriptors, what is nice is that gestures can share common attributes. And therefore, very few semantic descriptors can exponentially represent a huge number of gestures. OK? Something else we can do. We can compare between different gestures based on the semantic descriptors. So gestures that may look different something that our computer vision or our pixel intensities are going to say, hey, that's different, turns out that may be pretty similar in terms of function if the semantic descriptors are similar. OK? So it's quite interesting. So our challenge was to find semantic descriptors. We ran human factor studies. We did literature review. We call experts. We work with speech and hear language experts and psychologists, and we really try to come up with this list, comprehensive list of semantic descriptors that need to be measurable, representative, and predictable. So we came up with 64 semantic descriptors, and we incorporated that into our paradigm of uh, zero-shot learning. So how we actually completed the, the values of, now you have the semantic descriptors, but you need to populate with values, right? Could be binary values. What we did, crowdsource human studies using Amazon Mechanical Turk. We come up with a bunch of data sets, keep getting clips of videos. I'm going to show you an example. And we ask people to actually complete this interface, this wave interface, by basically switching on every semantic descriptor that they believe exists in the video that they are watching. OK? And this is going fast, but we actually completed really thousands of videos. So these annotations are available. You can look at that. And we came up with this binary representation where on the horizontal axis you have the semantic descriptors. And on the vertical ones, you have the gestures or the clips that we use. Now, one thing that you're going to notice is that this is very sparse, okay, which is not good. Um, of course, the more gestures that we're going to be collecting, this is going to be less sparse. But also one way to deal with the sparsity is rather than asking 20 people what do they think that this gesture, what are the attributes for this gesture, whether a certain attribute left, for example, of this gesture exists, and taking the majority of votes, I can take the average. And then instead of having a binary representation, I can have a continuous representation. And that will make the metrics less sparse and more useful to work. All right, 
So, going back to our gestural analogy, now we have gestures, now we have semantic descriptors, and now we have functions or commands. And we need to learn these two mappings. So how are we going to learn this? All right, so different ways of doing that. The, first of all, let's uh, clarify what do we have. We have scene classes, scene gestures. We have some gestures that we never saw in our lives. We have now semantic descriptors that are not annotated. And we have features that we can get through image processing, all techniques that you want. I don't know, we use Kinect. So we just pick the skeleton joints and we look at the velocity of the joints over, okay, over time. We use that, but you can do whatever you want, basically, any feature representation. So what we want to do for training is we're going to have our input features. We're going to learn a mapping. We have input features, sorry, on this side. And we're going to learn a mapping to a semantic descriptor, okay, to our semantic descriptors. And once we have the semantic descriptor mapping, we're going to also learn a function of mapping to categories. This is, what, this is going to be the strategy, okay? This is probably going to be a matrix that we're going to learn. And this can also be, for example, this is going to be another matrix, right? We're going to learn those two metrics. Uh, this is what we want to do. This is the objective. How we're going to do that? Traditional optimization of classification using a loss function. Uh, okay, so what we're going to do is we're going to learn these weights, these weight metrics that we're going to use to map our observations to a semantic space. And then we're going to compare whether the semantic that we're getting, the semantic vectors are equal to the ground truth. And if it's not equal, that's going to give me an error. And I want to minimize that error. So I'm going to fine tune this weight until I get the, the, the minimum error possible. But as you know, you know, if I have a, a function that is nonlinear, I may have actually multiple minima, so I need to add a regularizer, okay? And here is the regularizer, okay? Nice, this is going to work, guys, it's going to work. But, it's going to work, but the problem is that I'm not comparing errors on the categories that I predict, but rather on the semantic description, which is, which is not ideal. So we can actually do a twist to this. This, is, this was take one. This is, we call that direct attribute prediction. We, told, we go to take two. This, this algorithm is called embarrassingly simple one shot, a zero shot learning. And this is how it works, embarrassingly simple. We are still going to learn this weight matrix. Now we change the name. We're going to call that V, okay? We're still going to learn this matrix V to map into a semantic descriptor, but once we multiply by itself, we are going to get a category. So what we're going to measure is the error on the prediction of the category, not the semantic space. We still are going to optimize at the same time the metrics. We're going to still minimize the error here, but the main function is going to look at the error at the category level. And of course, I'm going to add regularizers in all the multipliers that I can to make sure that they get a single solution, all right? So this turns out works much nicer, much better. Um, the inference, uh, now the inference process is quite simple. I have my features of my new observation, okay, sorry. This is my new observations, this is my new, my new animal, pick a zebra. The zebra is going to be mapped to a semantic space. I'm going to compare that with all the semantic information that I have, and the closest one is going to be match. Well, but that means that they need a semantic descriptor of the semantic, right? I need a semantic descriptor of, of, the, of the zebra, but I told you that they don't have an observation of a zebra. So that, that's fine, because I'm not telling you that you're going to learn from nothing, okay? There's no free lunch, right? You need something to learn. So this is how we call this, con this is the part of the context, right? So you don't need to see a zebra as long as you can describe in general how a zebra would look like. Or you don't need to see a particular zebra. You don't need to see 10 zebras or 100 zebras as long as you describe, you can describe how a zebra looks like. And this is exactly how the semantic descriptor is. It's not associated to one observation. It's, it's associated with the class. So that's fine. That's fine. So 
that's the testing. So what we did is we check with our uh, approaches for, one, for zero shot learning using our data set that is not as, as large in terms of the classes, okay? But you see that we have a huge number of instances. And um, I'm going to show you some of the results that we got. Uh, first of all, these are the semantic descriptors populated, okay? We use 28 gestures, 23 seen classes of animals, if you want, they were actually gestures. Um, there were five unseen gestures, 34 semantic descriptors were actually used. Well, we tried to use the 61 that we have, but because, as I told you, this is sparse, there were semantic descriptors that were never used, basically, for this data set, okay? So we just got rid of them, but they are available. Um, we use both binary and continuous uh, matrices here, and the features that we use was a skeleton information. Okay, so we compare our approach with the dual attribute uh, mapping approach. We using support vector machine, using logistic uh, classifier. This is the embarrassingly simple uh, zero-shot learning and a semantic autoencoder, and we didn't do as good with the rest, and we wonder why. But I tell you that the more information that we have, more data, we are actually going to do better. And we made this problem more difficult and we indeed realized that we're going to do better. But I'm going to convince you, you don't need to believe me about that, okay? So let's go back, recap all the things that we talk about. In short, um, one, more than 100 observations. You can have less, of course, depends on the problem, but in most cases, one shot and all the classes are seen. One shot, one observation, okay, and the classes are seen. Um, zero shot learning, as many observations as you want, but what I'm going to show you is something that you never saw in terms of classes. Generalized approach is many training observations, but I'm going to give you whatever I want. Hard zero shot learning, one observation to learn, and you're going to get unseen classes. Generalized hard zero shot learning, I'm going to see, you, I'm going to give you one observation, and you need to be able to learn whatever. Okay? All right. So, uh, let's, let's move forward. So I'm going to save all the math okay, here. I'm going to explain the gist of how we solve the problem of generalized zero-shot learning. The idea is pretty simple. What we do is think about clustering, right? So we have clusters, and we, what we want to find out is a simple question. We get a new observation. We want to be able to answer the question whether this observation belongs to a known category or not. And depending on that, it's going to become either a generalized case or not. So think of clustering with a few caveats, okay? One of the changes is I'm not going to make any assumption about the distribution of the clusters, but think for a second that I know how the clusters look like, and based on the distances between the different clusters, I'm going to come up with a threshold that is going to tell me what is the probability that the new observation belongs to one of the clusters or is totally new. Okay? K mean, yes, two minutes. So K means it's not going to work because K mean normalize the distances always, so the distances add up to, a, to one. So that, that's not going to work, but um, the necessary changes can, can be done, and we explain in our papers how to do that, so we get a, a working solution. All right, so let's see how this works. Zero shot learning approach exactly what we did in the past. This is going to work. We have the semantic descriptors. We have the categories, okay? We do the learning. We come up with the optimal weights. Now, of course, we need to assume that we got a lot of observations, right? And we did got a lot of observations. But remember that the hard problem only has one observation. So I had something, I made something here to augment that one observation. What is exactly what I did? The one-shot learning approach that I showed you before. So if I go back, okay, I start here from a problem with a lot of data sets for zero-shot learning. Here I augmented the single observation into a lot of them using this neuroscientific approach. And the one-shot learning only needs one observation. But turns out that if I have one observation of each class, I can actually compute this threshold that I told you about to be able to say whether the new observation is part of the existing clusters or not. 
All right, so this is the training. Testing is actually pretty simple. I get a, an unseen uh, seen or unseen observation, I don't know. I'm going to run this test on my threshold that I found to see if this is unseen or if it's seen observation. If it's a seen observation, I'm going to match that with my data bank of semantic descriptors of seen observations. If it's unseen, I'm going to match it to my data bank of unseen semantic descriptors. Once I find the matching, I retrieve the class and viola that's actually done, okay? So we compare this with the existing paradigms that I told you about. Um, we compare with embarrassingly simple approach, the traditional approach, the non-general approach, one, uh, the, the traditional dual mapping, and actually you can see that we did, this is marginal accuracy, okay? This, means how better we do in, in terms of random accuracy, not absolute values because all these algorithms actually work really bad. Not really bad, but you know, with zero shot, we are talking about 30, 40% recognition accuracy, and that's huge, okay? Because this is data that you're classifying that you never saw the categories, all right? Of course, you see that as we increase with the number of classes, performances degradate, and that's, that's indeed a problem, all right? So this is our funding. We believe that we actually are solving the problem of generalized hard shot, zero, zero shot learning. And therefore, we think that we are very close actually to solve the problem of lifelong learning or at least to propose one solution for that. Where the main importance of this is that the phases of training and testing doesn't exist anymore. You only have a testing phase which actually acts as training as well. So you see that this is actually, the, the border is diffuse. And what you get is actually, the first observation is going to be always training, and from now on you're going to always be testing or living your life. That's what we call living. You don't have to separate this into training and testing anymore. All right, um, um, I think that I'm basically done. I want to acknowledge a, a, the other collaborators that I have and students working on this important problem. And with this, um, I'm going to say thank you very much for the invitation. And uh, all right, that's it. <laughs> thank you so much, Professor. Mm -hmm.